Welcome to the third of our core seminars of the EMI series. And um, by the way, if you are applying for the certificate, all three core seminars are required. And as well as three of the next set. The next set after this, starting next week, are the EAP seminars. So these first three, including today's, um, last week's, the week before, and then today, um, these are the core seminars. Uh, next. English speaking. Uh, next week we'll talk specifically about pronunciation issues, pronunciation issues that Koreans have, uh, ranging from vowels and consonants up to stress and intonation uh, for the purpose of uh, speaking lecture skills. Uh, today's seminar deals more generally with uh, lecture skills, not so much pronunciation or speaking, but general lecture skills. <coughs> for either, say, conferences or classroom teaching, whether you're going to be a classroom teacher or presenting your work at academic conferences. And so we're going to talk about things like introductions, the structure of um, academic talks, particularly introductions. And then we'll talk about uh, establishing flow in your talk. Um, two areas of flow are cohesion uh, and coherence. Cohesion is how words connect together. Coherence is how ideas um, connect together and how sentences and phrases connect together logically. And then we'll talk about difficulties in speaking like disfluencies, um, those kinds of things. And then finally, uh, hopefully when we have time, we will uh, watch a sample video, part of a sample video, and then kind of critique it uh, and s learn from his style. Okay, so <coughs> um, for lectures academic conference lectures, classroom lectures. Like I said before, um, just like for writing an academic paper, especially if you're a, a new teacher or if it's a new topic, you want to begin by structuring it very carefully. You want to do a careful outline. You want to do um, a good introduction, particularly. Uh, and we've talked about kind of the outline and structure before in terms of general English before, um, but we'll kind of review that. Uh, you want to um, start a, any lecture or presentation with a good introduction. You want to kind of um, st maybe state what your main point is, especially if it's a conference presentation. You want to come out directly within the first couple of minutes and state what your main point is. Uh, if it's a classroom, uh, if it's a classroom teaching, you kind of want to give your students an idea what um, the day's lecture is going to be about. So you want to begin with a good introduction. Uh, so. Uh, and I just gave you an introduction. I told you about what we're going to do today. I just did that for you. Uh, and th that's the sort of thing that you'd want to do in, in a lecture. You kind of want to tell people the main point of your talk, uh, what you're talking about um, in terms of the general idea, the main gist, uh, and then over probably an overview. Uh, it's most helpful if you give some sort of an overview of your uh, talk, the main points you're going to talk about. So there's kind of the main point that the whole lecture, the whole talk is about. Then kind of your main subpoints. You want to get people ideally an overview of the main subpoints you're going to talk about in uh, a lecture. Uh, and I just did that. I told you that we're talking about, you know, you know, giving lectures and presentations. And I gave you an overview of the main things we're going to talk about, like introductions and structure. Uh, aspects of flow, namely cohesion, coherence, and disfluencies and difficulties. I gave you an overview and a brief explanation of what those different components were when I gave you my introduction a moment ago. So that's an example of what you do in a lecture. You give kind of an overview of the things you're going to talk about. Like today I'm going to talk to you about X, whatever X is, and briefly maybe explain what X is, what it is that you're talking about. And then say, in order to talk about X, we need to look at A, B, C, and D. And you, and you kind of briefly explain what A, B, C, and D are, as I just did in my introduction. Uh, and that's kind of an overview. And ideally, you want to structure any lecture or presentation around probably three to five main points. So I said, you know, A, B, C, D. Uh, like you know, introduction elements, cohesion, coherence, disfluencies. Uh, three to five is kind of a magic number. And why is three to five kind of an ideal number? for a presentation or a lecture? Why 
why is three to five kind of an ideal number? Yeah, so you read my, my handout. Yes, human memory. Uh, it's called working memory. It's kind of in this part of the brain. Uh, we have a working memory where we can track a limited number of items uh, in a working memory. Uh, usually, for most people, it's about five items, maybe give or take two. Um, so five items is kind of an, uh, an ideal. You probably don't want to have more than five items if, if possible, if you can avoid it. You kind of lay out five kind of main points or sections of your talk. And then maybe each section of your talk, each of those sections might have three to five subpoints. Um, so recently I gave a talk about, uh, it was about English education in Korea. It was more of a general talk um, to a general audience. So I told him about the problems of English education in Korea, and I said, okay, I'm going to talk about some of the challenges you face as learners of English, and I'll talk about some of the myths about English learning. I'm going to talk about some of the motivation problems in learning English as a foreign language here in Korea. And I'm going to talk about you know, uh, finding uh, uh, freedom from the sort of burden of English. And this is a talk I gave, and under um, this kind of a, uh, finding freedom from the burden or the stress of English, you know, I talked. I said I'm going to talk about one, thinking about your goals and motivation. Two, uh, thinking about your language learning strategies, and three, finding your confidence as a language learner. That's a talk I gave recently. So that last point about you know, kind of finding freedom from the burden of English. There were three main points under there: your goals, strategies, uh, self-confidence. Uh, so, three to five uh, main points in your talk, and each of those main points can have three to five subpoints. So that's kind of the structure of an academic talk, and it's kind of like the structure of an ac of academic writing too. If you're writing an academic essay, a research article, generally you're going to say, "This is my thesis. I'm trying to prove to you X." And in order to prove X to you, maybe in the introduction paragraph, in order to prove X to you or demonstrate X, I'm going to look at uh, a, B, C, and D, and under each of those, I've got like, you know, A, B, C, or A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, E, three to five main points. And then each of those main points, each of those main sections of the paper will then in turn probably consist of three to five subpoints. Uh, under A, there's going to be like one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, and such. And an academic lecture is kind of similar. Uh, except that in an academic lecture, um, it sometimes, especially in the classroom, uh, or if it's a difficult topic, it actually helps to spell out these transitions. It helps to spell out explicitly from the beginning. I'm going to talk about uh, A, B, C, D. And when you get to maybe D, in order to look at D, we need to look at points one, two, and three. Uh, in a talk, it helps to spell those out in, in a way that you don't spell those out in writing necessarily. In academic writing, uh, maybe in your introduction, you spell out the main, you give an overview of the main points of the paper. Uh, but then the, the points in the paper kind of flow without explicitly um, going, you know, first, second, third necessarily. Uh, but in an academic talk, it helps to have more of those explicit markers, transitional words, we call them transitionals or connectives. So uh, we call them transitionals. Some people call them connectives or connectors. So it might be things like, first I'm going to talk about blah, blah, blah. Second, I'll talk about blah, blah, blah. Third, blah, blah, blah. Uh, these are kind of numerical connectors, uh, or just say I'm going to talk about A, B, and C. You spell out the structure beforehand explicitly for them. Uh, and this is to help their working memory. So speakers help the listeners working memory by spelling out, I'm going to talk about, in order to discuss X, we're going to look at A, B, C, and D. You're helping out their working memory because then as they're listening to your talk, they know where you are, hopefully, during your talk. They know. Uh, that you're talking about A and the very subpoints under section A. Then you, in a talk, you kind of say, okay, that's A. Now let's, let's look at the implications of A for B, and you spell out B. You spell out your transition. We're moving from A, section A to section B, from point A to point B. So while you're talking about section B, they know where you are. 
uh, because you've explicitly indicated where you are. Uh, and again, this is something we do in speaking, which we don't necessarily do as explicitly in academic writing, uh, maybe more so in popular writing, uh, because in listening, you kind of have to help people's working memory. Um, because if you're reading, when you're reading an academic essay, you can go back and forth and you can check where you are. And people can't do that so easily when they're listening. They have to rely on their working memory. So it helps to spell out these transitionals um, in these sections. Uh, back to introductions. So the first part is an overview. Uh, so most, not all, but usually a good lecture, a good um, conference presentation will um, state the topic and give an overview of the main points of the lecture. <coughs> Uh, other things that are probably helpful, a rationale. So uh, part two in the handout, a rationale. Why are you talking about this? If it's a conference presentation, you're probably providing um, in your introduction some justification for the research, why this research is interesting, why the audience should care about your research. Uh, you're kind of um, in the introduction and hopefully in the conclusion uh, or both, uh, one or both, uh, you're going to kind of justify um, the talk. You're going to provide the audience a rationale, a justification for why this is interesting. Why should they care? Why should they listen? Uh, if you're teaching a class, uh, it's going to be, why do you need to know this? Why is today's lecture topic important for you as a student in this field? Why is it important for the rest of this class? Um, because they kind of want to know why they're learning about it. Uh, how is it going to be important for the rest of this class? How is it going to tie in with um, maybe what you're going to learn later? How is it relevant to maybe what you'll be taking next semester? Or when you finish your, you know, when the student finishes his or her bachelor's degree and goes out and gets a job, how is this knowledge that we're talking about today, how is it relevant to what you're going to do in your career? Uh, you're going to maybe give them some kind of uh, a hint of why this is important. Um, it's important maybe for understanding other concepts in the class. Uh, it's important for practical applications, things that they're going to encounter in their careers later on, for example. Uh, if you're talking about uh, how to do proper liver surgery, that's going to be important for a doctor who's going to need to do liver surgery and know how to do liver surgery the right way. I once saw a uh, a medical lecture and uh, medical faculty were, had to do micro teaching for us and um, for micro teaching uh, one medical faculty member gave a talk about liver surgery because his specialty is liver cancer and he actually had, this is a very interesting talk because he had video of actual liver surgery this is a very good video because he talks about you, know, you have to you know uh, in the liver it's very tricky to operate on the liver because you might think you've got the tumor here, but no, you have to keep cutting further and further and go in because the tumor really could be hidden deep down in the liver. A very interesting video. <clears throat> That's a good example of, of a rationale. This is important if you're going to be a doctor. You need to know about how to do this properly. Uh, another element that's common sometimes in introductions might be a sort of a bridge or transition. Um, between maybe what you talked about before. If it's a class lecture, uh, you might begin by saying, last time we talked about uh, such and such, and today we're going to talk about this, and you're going to explain how they're related, or how today's topic uh, kind of relates to, or follows from uh, the previous topic. Like, uh, last time we talked about the rise of nationalism in Europe, and today we're going to extend this discussion to the rise of nationalism in East Asia. That's how you might do a lecture, history lecture, a transition, a bridge between what you did last time and what you did this time. That helps students to remember what you did last time and understand a logical connection uh, and a rationale for what you're doing now. Uh, and sometimes in an introduction, or especially at the end of class, you also might make a bridge to the, the next class. You might end a class by saying, okay, today we have talked about nationalism in East Asia, next time we're going to look at the economic impact of that upon such and such. I'm going to kind of extend it. Uh, kind of make students interested in what you're talking about next time. So some kind of a, a bridge, um, a, a, a segue. It's a, segue is not um, a motor scooter. If some of you know English, there's a motor scooter 
in America called a Segway. I'm not talking about motor scooters, uh, but Segway is a word we borrowed from French, which basically means a transition. <clears throat> so uh, some other things here at the bottom of page one and page two, sometimes you, you might begin a lecture with a thought-provoking question. Philosophers are good at doing this. Sometimes a philosophy teacher might say, would it be morally appropriate to kill a president if you think this president is dangerous? That's something that you might hear in a philosophy class. Just for discussion, by the way. It's just for ethical, logical discussion. Uh, but some kind of an interesting question, uh, a rhetorical question, uh, uh, sometimes maybe a statement of a problem, uh, uh, sometimes interesting stories or jokes. Uh, when I gave my lecture the other night about the problem of English education in Korea, I began with a personal story. This lecture was more of an informal lecture. So I told a story of uh, how some Korean boys, one time high school boys, came up to me wanting to practice English with me and they couldn't really say anything intelligent. And it was a terribly awkward experience, uh, I think, for them. It was a very funny story. Uh, this was kind of an interesting anecdote or story. Uh, which I used to introduce my lecture the other night about uh, the problem of English in Korea. Basically, I was at a bus stop one time uh, near Wang Shimni, and some high school boys came up to me and they wanted to practice English, but they couldn't. They opened their mouths and said, I, uh, hello, uh, I like kimchi, uh, I love you, and they walked away giggling and embarrassed. That's all they could say. They didn't know that it's not appropriate to say I love you to, an, to a stranger. Um, and for all those years of studying English, that's all they could say. They're very sad. And I use that as an introduction to my talk. So sometimes an interesting story, an interesting example. Uh, if there's some interesting recent hot news in the field, let's say if you're teaching a class on astronomy, and you might begin, just yesterday, scientists announced that they've discovered a possible Earth-like planet. It's only, four, it's only three times as big as Earth, uh, and it's, I don't know, 200 light years away. And they think that the planet is like such and such. I'm just making this up. But something like that, if there's something kind of a, something interesting, an interesting example like that. <clears throat> so these are various um, elements you can use to begin introductions to get the student's attention. Uh, another reason why I talk about the structure uh, of essays, like the three to five point um, uh, item structure of an academic talk or presentation, uh, and the need for transitionals uh, is this. If you're teaching a class, uh, let's say an hour long class, are students able to really pay attention for 60 minutes? No. How long do you think they can pay attention? Okay, maybe five to ten minutes. Uh, the typical attention span of an adult listening to a lecture is about ten minutes. Uh, maybe if you're lucky, ten minutes. Could be five minutes. Uh, and because attention really depends on your mental energy, your concentration, which really comes from here. The, the front part of your brain really controls a lot of things and controls your attention, what you're able to focus your mental energy on and your working memory. And it's all kind of up here in the front part of the brain. Um, after about 10 minutes, if their attention kind of is here, and after 10 minutes it kind of drops, and, after, and their mind wanders, and hopefully they come back, but after the mind comes back, they don't have as much energy as before, and it keeps dropping off until the end, and they see the clock, and it's about to end. <laughs> 10 minutes left, wow, we're going to get out of here. Uh, and so things that, this is kind of hard to fight if you're actually teaching a class, of course, one thing is to break up your lecture, don't just talk for 60 minutes, but do some, you know, throw some questions at them, do some interactive activities, have them do a group discussion or a pair discussion activity, break up your lecture with other things, don't just talk for 60 minutes. But if it's a conference presentation, you probably have like 20 minutes to continuously talk. But So this is a reason, one reason for using transitionals and also for having a clearly structured uh, presentation with about three to five main points. Uh, it helps students to follow, otherwise um, they're not going to pay attention. So when you kind of use a transition word, a transition expression, now, we've talk, now that we've talked about A, let's move on to B. That kind of says to them, okay, come back uh, to here and refocus. <clears throat> um, 
there is an extra handout on the web website about questions, types of questions you can use in, say, lectures and teaching. Um, the better kinds of, a lot of teachers, traditional teachers, might um, re use really uh, boring questions. You don't want to use boring questions. Boring questions are things like, things that are obvious, um, that are just repeating information, or repeating what they have, should have heard from the lecture, or just repeating back what they probably have read or should have read from the textbook. That's a, what we call a knowledge display question, just repeating back knowledge that's kind of basic that they should already know from your lecture or the reading. That's kind of a boring question. It doesn't really get students to think. You probably want to use more interesting kinds of questions throughout your lecture, uh, maybe even occasionally during an academic conference presentation, but especially in a classroom lecture, uh, because you're fighting this, so it helps to also throw out interesting questions, questions that make students think. So questions that are, for example, um, involving application. Okay, so application questions might be, you've understood this so far, how would you apply this conceptual knowledge to something else? So, uh, let's say we've been talking about uh, nationalism in uh, Western Europe and nationalism in Japan, and I point to you and I ask you, okay, so what do you think about the nationalism in Korean history? Uh, this might be, I'm asking you to apply We've analyzed the components of nationalism in, say, Europe and Japan and uh, other places, and I get you to now apply this to think about the Korean context, because that's not in the book. You know, if your book is from America, your textbook, they may not talk, say that much about um, more unique situations. So we've been talking about X. How would you apply X to some situation like situation A? Get students to apply their knowledge in something that's not in the book. Uh, analysis questions, getting them to analyze. Okay, so these are the concepts, the tools I've given you. How would you um, analyze this? Or we've talked about this, how would you explain this in your own terms? Uh, basically questions that get students to analyze or solve a problem. Okay, so solve a problem. I have explained to you the principles of thermodynamics, physics. So I'll give you a problem here. Um, this is information about the energy state of this particular system. Let's say it's um, a star system or something. So these are the information, these are the formulas you've learned. So I'll give you a problem to solve. How would you apply these formulas to this situation? Something you haven't seen before. Uh, sometimes synthesis, where basically I make you <coughs> draw different things together, like today we learned about this, last week you learned about that, how would you put them together and come up with some alternative explanation? Uh, so uh, today we learned about you know this trend in political science and last week we learned about that kind of force in political science. So taking what we learned today and last week, how would you apply this to analyzing the situation in uh, German politics in this example? Uh, Finally, kind of evaluation or critique. Again, this is an extra handout on the website, not in the main handout, but evaluation or critique questions where I basically present you something and I make you critique and analyze, um, evaluate something. Okay, so we've talked about such and such. Uh, based on your understanding, what is your evaluation of this situation? Let's say I'll give you a situation like some information about uh, modern German politics, and I'll ask you to critique and evaluate things. That means finding out maybe the good things or the bad things, or maybe we've learned about this theory. How well does this theory apply to this situation? Does this theory work as well at explaining this kind of problem? I'm asking you to critique and evaluate whether this is a good theory uh, or not. Or, oh, let's take an example from biology. Uh, theory of evolution, there's a traditional theory of evolution which basically focuses on natural selection uh, as a force. And there are some people, a famous biologist named Edward Wilson, who believes in group selection is also an important force. So I might tell you, why don't you critique the group selection theory? 
critique Wilson's group selection theory. Is group selection uh, also a likely a good scientific theory that would also explain uh, evolution in addition to natural selection? Group selection is the idea that uh, communities, groups, uh, confer a benefit or an advantage upon, or the genes confer a benefit upon a whole group, not just an individual. And some evolutionists debate this right now. So I'm asking you to critique or evaluate something. <clears throat> uh, so these are kinds of questions that you're going to throw out because you are fighting this attention problem. Uh, and this helps you to break up your lecture. It makes students think. Okay. Uh, next point, basically cohesion. And one of the EAP seminars later on in this semester is going to talk more specifically about cohesion. This is how words connect together. And sometimes this differs from one field to another, um, especially in academic writing. <clears throat> but basically, when you say um, a word, people try to identify what does that word refer to, what does it mean. Um, in, in speaking, there are some things we might do. The icon number one, we might repeat the same noun again and again. It's easy to follow. Yeah, it's kind of boring, though, but it's easy for people to understand what you're talking about. This, again, is perhaps more common in sciences. When the, like in writing, uh, in science writing, they don't use pronouns very often, or in engineering writing, you don't use pronouns too often because if you say it in a science paper, it might be, especially physics or chemistry, what does it refer to? Because you're talking about a number of different things at the same time. Um, so it may not be very clear. So sometimes we repeat the same nouns. Uh, number two, sometimes you use synonyms or paraphrases. Uh, There's some examples there. I mean, X hypothesis, so and so's proposal, that, and so on. Uh, number three, sometimes what we call predicate subject chains. Uh, if you know predicate, that's kind of like the verb phrase. So here, this example in number three, in thermal vents, scientists discovered something new called archaeobacteria. So that's in the predicate. I've mentioned a new concept, a new noun, archaeobacteria. Next sentence, these archaeobacteria, however, da da da. So this next sentence starts with that word. And this is a common way of achieving cohesion. Uh, <clears throat> and then in the following sentences, I might repeat archaeobacteria as a subject. Archaeobacteria do this, archaeobacteria do that, uh, archaeobacteria have been found to, archaeobacteria are known for, and so on. And they're often finding these things at ungodly hot temperatures in the ocean, in ocean vents. Um, I think there was just a recent discovery about some extremely hot ocean vents in the Caribbean with uh, weird life forms down there. Uh, number four, sometimes you start a sentence with a new subject. Uh, in speaking, though, we might shift, we do kind of a transition to a new subject. And oftentimes, this is accompanied in speaking by a rise in intonation. So I might be going, blah, 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 blah. Now let's look at such and such. So I start a sentence with now. And that can be a transition to a new subject. Or I might be going, blah, 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 uh, normal bacteria, blah, blah, blah. Archaea bacteria, however, uh, have been recently found. So I started a sentence with a new subject. But to get people to wake up, I increase my intonation, my intonation goes up. And I don't know about in Korean, but in English speaking, that's a common device in speaking to indicate a shift to a new subject, to a new topic, with a rise in intonation on the beginning of the sentence. Like, now let's move on to da da da. Or blah blah blah. Archaeobacteria, however, blah blah blah. So, a rising intonation at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> number five, number five is uh, omitted or deleted subjects. Uh, I don't know how much of a problem this is for you in academic speaking, but in colloquial English, well, sometimes we drop subjects, like the sentence or the subject might get left out, but that's more colloquial or informal style. But I found that in Chinese and Korean, it's very common to drop subjects or objects from sentences. Uh, and that's not so common in English. Or if it is in English, it's more in informal English. 
So in Korean, you often drop subjects if it's understood from the context. In English, that's kind of, you can't do that as much. Especially in an academic lecture, if you do that, people will be confused. Uh, I remember several years ago, well, many years ago, I was trying to learn Chinese, and I got to the, I get to like a second year level of Chinese. I forgot it since then, so don't try to speak to me in Chinese. I've forgotten. But I tried to listen to some of my Chinese friends' conversations, and although I could understand many of the words, I couldn't tell what they were talking about because they were dropping subjects. It's a very common thing in Chinese to drop out, to leave out the subject of a sentence. In English, it's more limited to um, um, conversational phrases where if it's the same subject as the sentence right before it, then probably we can drop the subject in conversation, but not so much in academic speaking. Um, I didn't really, I forgot to put in an example here of a colloquial subject drop sentence in English, but maybe in informal English we might say, how is your performance? The person might reply, went well. So I left out the subject, instead of saying it went well, I just say went well. Uh, uh, how is the experiment? Good. Uh, instead of saying it was good. But that's very informal and colloquial. In academic speaking, m more often we don't drop subjects as much in academic English. Um, let's move on to coherence, and we've got a lot more to say on coherence. There's another lecture specifically about coherence and logical flow, but uh, I'm going to focus on certain transitionals. Um, there's a lot more to coherence than transitionals, but here on page three, there's some Korean transitionals. Some of these translate well into English, some do not. So take a look at these for one minute and tell me, uh, if you want to talk with a partner or do this by yourself, which of these translate into English, which don't translate very well? Because you might be tempted to think in Korean and then translate it into English. Well, it might not work. So take a minute to look at these. Okay, so if they translate well, you probably shouldn't have to consult your dictionary because that means you probably know how to translate them. And if you uh, don't, if you're having to consult your dictionary, then maybe there isn't a very natural translation. So uh, let's see, number one, took Billy. That's pretty easy, especially. Okay, you can do that probably more so in speaking, but as we'll talk about later on when we talk about academic writing in a later seminar, not so often in academic writing. Uh, to start a sentence, but in speaking, it's probably okay. What does tukbyal he do, or especially, in particular? It's kind of emphasizing the whole sentence. Uh, it's kind of putting emphasis on the whole sentence, or whole idea. Uh, if it's inside the sentence, like he is especially fat, uh, especially modifies fat. So if you put especially at the beginning of a sentence, it's modifying the whole sentence, and it's uh, like, especially I would like to go to to do, to do or something. Or I'm kind of modifying the whole idea. Uh, and that works okay in speaking. That doesn't work so well in English academic writing though. We'll see. Number two, kunde, kunde. That's, what is that? Before number two, what about particularly? In particular? Um, yeah, that's kind of like especially, although it's not, especially is a bit stronger. It's more emphatic than in particular. Um, so actually in academic writing in particular would be better to start a sentence. Um, okay, kunde uh, kunde is. Hmm? By the way. And then. And then. Okay. 
Okay, so those will work well. But Kuruna, Kratiman, okay, that means but, however. Uh, probably however is a bit of a stronger contrast than but. Uh, in speaking, we sometimes say but with an extra rising intonation for a stronger contrast. Although probably in academic style, it's better to say however for a stronger contrast. And especially in academic writing, it would be better to say however if you want a stronger contrast than just but. Um, what could I so? I'm not sure about could I so. What is could I so? Therefore. Okay, that works well. Uh, thus, therefore, and sometimes it's good to know the variety. Later on, I'll have a handout on different transitional words in English on my website. Kredo, uh, what is kredo? Hmm? Hmm? So I didn't hear very well. Although? Okay, good. You don't? What about in speaking? More spoken? Okay. Kranika uh, is what? That is? Okay. I'm not sure about that. Now, seven, tricky one. We've a noun with n or n. Does that translate into English? No. And so I think, at least in writing, I think I noticed Koreans struggling because they don't know how to do, um, how to do this. And what is, what is the function of uh, un or nun on a noun? It's for a subject. It's for a subject, but it's... Sometimes, uh, yeah. Because you could also put, you know, e or ga as opposed to un or nun. So why do you sometimes put nun or un instead of, you know, these guys? Yeah, or some linguists will say something different from a subject is something called a topic, which is kind of a linguistic term in this sense. Uh, but I think, I'm not sure, but I think sometimes this is used for, the un or nun is maybe used for a topic transition, when you switch to a new topic, or when you return to an old topic, maybe. I think it's for, my, my theory, I'm not sure because my Korean is really bad, but I think uh, it's often, not always, but often uh, for topic shifts uh, as well as contrasts, is making contrast between topics and shifting, changing topics. And there's nothing like this in English. And so you may wonder, how do I do that in English? Well, like I said, in English sometimes in speaking, use the high, begin a sentence with a high intonation. That's for topic shift. Uh, sometimes in spoken English, not, not as much in write, academic writing, but in spoken English we have things like, uh, by the way, or as for, or speaking of, or as I said before, tr um, transitions like that to return to a topic, um, or to start a sentence with a new subject and put a high intonation on it to tell people new topic. Um, how about itta? By the way, I had an earlier version with some others. I cut them out because I had no idea why I put them in there. Uh, but itta, there is, there is, there are. Um, I don't know if you use it like a transition in Korean, but in English, it's more of a transition for introducing an, uh, a new topic. It's more of like for a new topic, uh, introducing something uh, new to the flow of the conversation. It's more common in conversational English or in speaking than it is in academic writing, by the way. Uh, so it's kind of like there is, which in English is for introducing a new topic uh, to your discussion. Um, Eleven, Kyungyue, Kyungyue Nun. In case of, this one doesn't really translate so well into English. Uh, I think in Korean it's used commonly as a transitional expression, but not so much in English. In, in English, in case of is more like a conditional, like in case of fire, call 911. Our emergency number in the States is 911, here it's 119, in case of fire. So it's like a conditional. Uh, so this doesn't translate well into English, in case of. Uh, sometimes you might say, in my case, or in case of such, uh, that might work, but that's very colloquial, very informal. And that doesn't work in writing, in academic writing, by the way. Uh, so in case of, that's not the same as Kyungyue Nun, not exactly, but maybe in my case, or in, in such and such situation or in this situation, or such. 
uh, sometimes you can just leave it out altogether. Like instead of saying, in the case of Germany, the reunification caused a lot of economic problems, to say, just simplify it, German reunification or reunification in Germany caused a lot of problems. So just get rid of, get rid of that in case of Germany, which sounds Konglish. <coughs> um, so that doesn't really translate. Uh, I've also sometimes seen writers do try to translate uh, jinga, jinga ro hisa or something, kind of like as evidence. I've seen people write as evidence, but that doesn't work. That sounds Konglish uh, as evidence. Uh, maybe, I don't know, for example, or, um, or maybe just completely paraphrase it by saying uh, uh, further support for this comes from, because I think the, I've seen people use this in context where they're trying to delineate the different kinds of support or evidence for something, and it's better to say maybe just completely rephrase it by saying uh, further evidence comes from such and such, or further support from this comes from such and such, because translating this Korean phrase into English doesn't work. How about hokshi? Because I'm not sure. I hear hokshi a lot, but I'm not sure how it's used, because my Korean is not very good. By chance, maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I because I hear hokshi a lot, especially in female conversations, uh, and I don't really know how it's used. Um, I wonder because in English, in very colloquial English, we have the word like. You hear young people like they'll put like the word like like before like every phrase. You know, like that's how younger people talk, and uh, even people in my generation, we sometimes use like. It's kind of like maybe, for example, uh, like like now I'm self-conscious and like I'm saying like all the time now. <clears throat> I, I don't know if like in that sense is kind of like hokshi. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. It happened to, okay. okay. Sounds, sounds kind of different from the English like. So, uh, so it's not, probably hokshi is probably hard to translate into English. I'd like to ask some more people some more detailed questions about hokshi. Uh, so I haven't tried to use it. Uh, next is disfluencies, which is kind of a technical term in linguistics and psychology for when you're trying to say something, but you can't think of what to say. This, uh, of course, happens to everybody. Usually this happens before the predicate. Do you know predicate? Kind of like the verb phrase. You've got the subject of a sentence. The subject, which is usually what you were talking about before, so that's fresh in your mind, that's in your working memory. But when you get to the predicate, like the verb phrase, the verb, and whatever comes after it, it's sometimes harder to think of what you're going to say because usually that is expressing new information. Uh, and that's where people usually pause um, as they're trying to think of something, like I just did, right there. <clears throat> uh, disfluencies often happen uh, in the predicates. And speakers do different things. Sometimes people go, uh, um, uh. Now, is it good if a speaker says that a lot? Yeah, it's kind of annoying. So you want to avoid saying, uh, too much. If, it's, if it becomes a habit, it sounds like you're not very prepared, or it sounds like you're not very confident. So what's a better thing to do instead of saying, uh? Yes, when in the middle of a sentence, yes is going to sound funny. Uh, okay, so sometimes you backtrack and you might repeat yourself, hopefully, hoping that that will uh, kind of jar your memory and help you to remember what you're going to say. So sometimes people do that. They go back and paraphrase what they're going to say. Uh, and sometimes they might kind of indicate it by saying, like, I mean, or, you know, I mean, and go back. Sometimes it helps. Um, what are some other strategies for disfluencies? Hmm? Hmm? Okay, so, yeah, so, 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so like what I want to say is that it's kind of a uh, that's kind of like a, a rephrasing strategy, a reformulation or recast. That's at the bottom of the page. A reformulation or recast. You're trying to reformulate what you're saying. What I want to say is, and that's a good example. Another thing sometimes is instead of saying a, uh, is to use a silent pause. See, I just did that. I just did a silent pause. I paused for one second. And sometimes that's enough to help you think of what you're going to say. It sounds better than going, um, uh. So sometimes if you just pause for a couple seconds, one second, two seconds, that is often enough for you to think of what you're going to say. And the advantage is it holds people's attention. If you're going, um, they're going to lose interest, especially if you keep saying, um, uh. But if you do a silent pause, it gets their attention. It makes them pay attention, right? <clears throat> oh. The speech I gave uh, the other night, as I mentioned, I came to one point, I had to memorize my speech, uh, which was kind of hard. I'll, in a later seminar, I'll tell, tell you about how to memorize speeches if you ever have to do that. <clears throat> but I came to a point where I had like this really dramatic emphasis stuff, very emphatic stuff, I said that, and right there, as soon as I finished saying something, I was very emphatic. I had to think for a second what I was going to say next, because I had written my speech out and I had to memorize it. And I have to work. I just paused there, silent pause, worked very well, held their attention. Then I thought of what the next sentence was in my prepared speech. So silent pauses are better. Um, it's, uh, sometimes you can change topics. You don't want to apologize, by the way. I'm sorry I'm not well prepared today, you know, that's not good because they want a speaker who's confident. Uh, so don't apologize, just do your best. And as we say, wing it, just try to improvise and get through and make them uh, think that you're speaking naturally, speak naturally as possible, and make them think that you're speaking naturally. Don't let them see that you're nervous, don't apologize, don't... Uh, Say, well, you know, sorry, I didn't have time to prepare for today's lecture, you know, I was really busy, you know, that doesn't really instill their confidence, uh, and they may not be interested in continuing to hear the lecture. Uh, another strategy on the last page, sometimes it helps to fall back on light words, what we call, what I'm calling light words. These are words that are kind of very general in meaning, and it can be helpful to know these, especially this stuff, these, these disfluencies, these pauses, it's even harder in a second language because your working memory has to work a lot more to do this in a foreign language. And I'm assuming you're here because you're planning to teach in English or at least do conference presentations in English, where it's a challenge to do this in a second language and you have more of a problem with disfluencies. So uh, light words, these are kind of very common general use words, very general meanings. They're probably not the words you would use so much in academic writing. In academic writing, we prefer more specific words. But in speaking, uh, it's more okay to fall back on these words. When you can't think of the right verb, for example, you can use a common verb like do or make or set or go or run, ran an experiment, we did an experiment. Uh, it might take you, um, one second to think of the word conduct an experiment, perform an experiment, you can just say we did an experiment, very easy. So sometimes kind of knowing these light verbs and other light words can be simple things to fall back on. <clears throat> uh, any um, questions by the way? Okay, this takes a minute for the projector and all to come on. So I'm going to, um, hopefully if this works, why this is slow. I feel like this is made by Microsoft or something so slow. You know I don't like Microsoft. Okay, there's the image. I'm going to play you a video, maybe 10 minutes of a video by, you know Michael Sandel? Yeah. Okay, he's a philosophy professor from Harvard. Usually philosophy professors are boring people, uh, but this guy is actually quite a good lecturer. Um, so notice how he begins his lecture in a second. This is a course about 
talk justice and we begin with a story. Suppose you're the driver of a trolley car and your trolley car is hurtling down the track at 60 miles an hour. And at the end of the track, you notice five workers working on the track. You try to stop, but you can't. Your brakes don't work. You feel desperate because you know that if you crash into these five workers, they will all die. Let's assume you know that for sure. And so you feel helpless until you notice that there is, off to the right, a side track. And at the end of that track, there is one worker working on the track. Your steering wheel works, so you can turn the trolley car, if you want to, onto the side track, killing the one, but sparing the five. Here's our first question. What's the right thing to do? What would you do? Let's take a poll. How many would turn the trolley car onto the side track? Raise your hands. How many wouldn't? How many would go straight ahead? Keep your hands up, those of you who would go straight ahead. A handful of majority would turn. Let's hear first, now we need to begin to investigate the reasons why you think it's the right thing to do. Let's begin with those in the majority who would turn to go onto the side track. Why would you do it? What would be your reason? Who's willing to volunteer a reason? Go ahead, stand up. Because it, it can't be right to kill five people when you can only kill one person instead. It wouldn't be right to kill five if you could kill one person instead. That's a good reason. That's a good reason. Who else? Does everybody agree with that reason? Go ahead. Um, well, I think it's the same reason on 9-11 uh, with regard to people who, who flew the plane into the uh, Pennsylvania field as heroes because they chose to kill the people in the plane and not um, kill more people in uh, big buildings. So the principle there was the same on 9-11. It's a tragic circumstance. But better to kill one and so that five can live? Is that the reason most of you had those of you who would turn? Yes? Let's hear now from those in the minority. Okay, let me stop there. So this is a class on moral philosophy and ethics. And again, like I said, usually philosophers are not very interesting people, but he's a very interesting speaker. Uh, I know because I tried taking philosophy class in college and the guys that I had were really strange um, <laughs> people. So I know from experience um, he's different. So. What are your observations of his lecture? What do you notice about his lecture and the way he started it? Hmm? He begins with a provocative question, a moral dilemma, which he likes to do in his classes. Um, did he begin with an introduction, an overview, like what I just told you to do? No. He violated the rules uh, of... of uh, typical lectures. Uh, he's an expert and he can do that. Uh, occasionally you can break the rules and get away with it because here he's doing it for dramatic effect, uh, which is kind of unusual, especially at the beginning of the semester. So sometimes you can break the rules like he did. He begins with a really provocative question. Uh, and that's kind of unusual. Uh, usually when you teach, you do want to have a clear in introduction and such. And I think in his later, in some of his other lectures, he does have more of an introduction in his other lectures in this series. Okay, any other things you notice about his lecture? His teaching style? He's strong. Hmm? He's strong. He walks around? Yes, he walks around. And I think uh, a lot of traditional Korean professors stand in one place during the class, kind of like a statue. <laughs> Do you like watching statues? Uh, no, and especially if you're teaching in an international environment or if you're presenting at an international conference, you want to move around a little bit. You, you, and often 
oftentimes, especially at a conference, you may be limited to a podium space like this, but you can still move within a couple of meters. Even if you're having to run PowerPoint, you still have a couple of meters of space to work with where you can move around because it's more interesting when you move around. Uh, if you notice Steve Jobs, like I said, he covers pretty much much of the stage. He uh, often starts at the, you know, at least one talk I've watched of his in detail, he starts at the podium on one side and he moves around in the center. He spends a lot of time in the center, but not in the very center. He's kind of moving around in the center of the stage. Occasionally he goes over there yeah. and such. He uses the whole space, um, but it's, it's, it's comfortable. It's, it's kind of easy to watch. You don't want to be erratic. You don't want to be like somebody who's had way too much espresso. Uh, like you're moving around like this all the time. Uh, uh, so you don't have to move as much as Steve Jobs. Uh, you can move at least a moderate amount. He moves around a moderate amount, and that helps people to stay attention, to keep it, to pay attention. Um, and especially if you've got a PowerPoint, you want people to focus on you and not the PowerPoint. Does he use PowerPoint, by the way? No. Uh, you don't necessarily have to use a PowerPoint. Maybe in, in some fields it's more necessary to use visual aids, like in some like biomedical and science classes, sometimes a PowerPoint is helpful, but it's not like you have to use it the whole time. You don't have to depend on it for the whole class. Sometimes you can break away from your PowerPoint and interact with the class personally, because you want, you're the teacher, not the PowerPoint. You want the students to pay attention to you, uh, not to the screen all the time. Yeah, you're the teacher, not the screen. Um, He's teaching in a, in a kind of course where it's really not necessary to use PowerPoints. Occasionally he uses visual aids. Okay, anything else that you notice? In his speaking, he's so teasing the whole audience. Okay, he's looking at the whole audience. But well, you can turn off the sound if you want to. I'm kind of tired of the thumping things. Uh, there's a problem with the sound system. It doesn't really have any rhythm. You know. <laughs> He is looking at the whole audience. Okay. Some people who are um, not used to public speaking, they'll kind of avoid eye contact with the audience. They'll look at their notes and they'll look at the PowerPoint. That's really bad. That's going to make sure your audience falls asleep. Uh, he looks at the audience. He talks to them. He makes eye contact with the whole audience. It doesn't mean you have to look at everybody, but it, at least every part of the room. You look at every part of the room. And he's also engaging the audience. Even though it's a huge class, probably 500 students at least here, you see, he's still, taking, he's still posing questions and he's taking questions from the audience. He probably won't be able to take questions from everybody, uh, even over the semester, because there are hundreds of kids here. But at least from some people, he will take questions and he's gonna, if you continue to watch this, he'll play people pull against each other, like uh, um, this guy has this opinion, he's going to let this guy talk, and then, you know, then she has a different opinion, he's going to have them actually kind of argue with each other. You'll see when he, he does this. So he gets people, students to interact with each other. Uh, he interacts with the students, even though it's a big class. And so you, those are good examples of how to use questions. He's using thoughtful questions. He gets students to think. Uh, like, what's your reason for that? Okay, then do you agree with him? If not, why do you disagree with him? Okay, what's your response to her? Uh, he plays them against each other. He makes them think. He makes them justify their answers. So he's asking analytical questions. He makes them justify their um, uh, opinions. What else do you notice? Okay. Do you like his hand gestures? Probably the one of the uh, later seminars will talk more about gestures and body language. But what do you notice about his gestures and his body language? Why do you like why do you like his gestures, his hand gestures, for example? Just uh, just uh, that. Yes. Okay. So he's not being a statue. He's not being too 
he's not being too erratic like an Italian person, you know, Italians go, uh, you know, uh, or some younger Americans, I see young, some younger Americans on TV, and they gesture too much, doing like this, it's very annoying. He's very calm, he uses hand gestures well to help with the flow of thought and to emphasize his points. And if you're using media like a PowerPoint, you can also use hand gestures to point to the media, draw people's attention to the media. But he's basically using his hands in front of his body to his side. Uh, and those are good uses of gestures. What are gestures that you don't want to do during a talk? What kinds of body language do you not want to do during a talk? What kind of body language do you find distracting? Yeah, yeah. Uh, those could be signs of nervousness. Yeah, they're playing with their hair, they're scratching themselves, uh, or it could be just standing still like a statue, or they're holding on too much to uh, furniture, uh, like they're afraid they're going to float away, and they need to hold on to the podium, they don't trust the Earth's gravity. Okay, what are other things you notice about his lecture? Okay, his speed of speech, and if you're uh, speaking in English to uh, other Koreans, this is especially important. If you're teaching, someday if you're going to be teaching undergraduates who are Koreans, English is not their first language. The rate of speech is important. He speaks very carefully, pretty slowly, so I think probably Korean undergrads, many of them could understand him. Uh, if they can handle lectures at Kode, they can understand him. So. If you're a new teacher, new teachers sometimes don't know how to plan the material, and so they've got a lot of material to get through. They think they should cover all of the contents, and so they talk really quickly because they have so much material to cover. They're stressed because they want to finish all of the material. Uh, and we'll talk about that's kind of a time management and content management problem, which we'll talk about later. But basically in teaching, especially in some subjects like science and medicine, you've got huge amounts of contents, the textbooks are this big, uh, and you feel like you have to cover all the contents. Well, you can't reasonably cover all of the contents of a chapter uh, as a teacher. In that kind of case, when you're dealing with a subject that just has a lot of content, <clears throat> maybe you want to focus on really the main ideas of the chapter, the main ideas of the unit. Um, because if the students can get the main ideas, the main concepts, and how different things are related, then they can go back later and read the chapter and get the details, and then you can quiz them on that to make sure they've read the details. Because if you try to cover all of the details in the class, for the students it's like an information dump. Um, the textbook chapter uh, it may be a lot of information and they don't know what to do with all of that information, an ocean of information. And if your class presents the same experience, an ocean of information, they won't really understand and they won't remember because if they just try to cram a lot of information into the brain, they will forget after your course is over. <clears throat> but if you help them just understand the main concepts, the main ideas, uh, and tell them, okay, now that you understand the main ideas, then read the chapter, get the details, because it will be on the next test. They can better remember the ideas and the details later on, uh, especially if your, your teaching style emphasizes maybe interactive activities and or other things, hands-on activities, um, hands-on problem-solving activities, things that help them to really grasp the ideas in depth in-depth learning of the main things, not trying to cover a lot of details. Uh, do you notice anything else about his talk? Any other things, any things you liked? Hmm? I think he's using light words. Light words? Okay. Okay, good. What were some light words that you heard? Do you remember some examples? Okay, probably, um, because he is a pretty under easy to understand person. He doesn't use a lot of technical, philosophical language, which you might expect. Perhaps because partly this is um, kind of an introductory course. 
uh, but even for an introductory course, he's being careful not to overdo the technical language. Okay, what else? Do you like his intonation? Yeah, I like his intonation. It's pretty easy to understand. It's comfortable. You notice he has good intonation. He uses it to, to like I said, do topic shifts, the topic shifts I talked about. Uh, and this is a, a, something that you may have to work on more as a Korean speaker. Korean has, I think, no intonation, basically. Uh, it's a toneless language. English has a very complex system of intonation, particularly from the stress system. English has complicated stress system. Uh, it's a very stressful language, right? Uh, we have word stress. In fact, we have different levels of word stress, like main stress, secondary stress, unstressed. Then we have stresses on compound nouns and other compound words. And then phrases like a verb phrase, a noun phrase, like nouns tend to have more stress than the adjectives before them. Uh, like when I was young, I, well, I'll talk more about that next week with pronunciation. <coughs> um, we have sentence stress. So usually in the predicate, uh, usually one word, uh, most often in the predicate, one word gets more stress than other uh, words in the sentence. There's a, your intonation tends to go up. Uh, and down at, toward the end of the sentence. And toward the end of the sentence, your stress, your intonation goes down at the very end. Uh, we'll probably talk more about that next week. Uh, stress itself, whether it's word stress, phrase stress, um, compound stress, or sentence stress, involves intonation. Uh, we'll talk about that next week. Your intonation goes up and down. Uh, so English requires a lot of intonation, a lot of intonation. And, and one of the later uh, lectures will talk more about intonation and the energy you need to do that. But if you're speaking in English, you have to be careful if you're Korean uh, not to speak in a monotone. Koreans tend to speak in a monotone and it's something you have to watch out for because a monotone can help your audience fall asleep. Uh, we, uh, <clears throat> especially in English. So English requires a lot more intonation. Uh, a lot more energy probably for you in the second language especially. Um, I think if you continue to listen to those lectures you probably notice transitional expressions, transition words. Uh, I've, I don't remember but I've listened to this before and I've picked out transition words. Um, so uh, later when we will talk about writing and we'll talk about coherence in writing especially in that seminar later on we will talk more about transitional expressions because uh, in speaking and in writing you use transitional words things like first, second, third in speaking especially things like since, but, thus, therefore, consequently and so on transitional words and I'll have a handout later on the website on the EAP seminars uh, about that but if you listen to him you will notice transitional expressions transitional words um, Generally, he has pretty clearly structured lectures. So the professors that are easier to listen to are those who have clearly structured lectures. They're logically organized, easy to follow. Uh, so probably the lectures are, they're preparing by outlining them. If you're a beginning teacher, beginning lecturer, you probably want to do an outline of paper. After you get good at it, you can do outlines in your head. I usually do outlines mentally for my classes or my lectures. Uh, or my handout serves as an outline. Maybe for some of you, if you use a PowerPoint, your PowerPoint serves as, as an outline. Uh, but a clear logical outline is important for people to follow. <clears throat> Any questions about, uh, about all of this? Okay, typical Korean response. <laughs> no, silence, okay. Americans are usually ready to jump up and throw in questions. But <clears throat> very interesting cultural difference. Okay, so next week, uh, I know it's the Friday before Chuseok next week, but uh, I believe that's right, yeah, 28th. So, uh, but I hope you'll come. We'll talk about pronunciation problems that Koreans have, typical pronunciation issues ranging from vowels and consonants, unapt to stress and intonation, and all of that stuff. 
uh, and kind of straightforward problems. It's a very difficult problem for Koreans or for any second language learner. Pronunciation is really hard in second language. Basically, uh, what I'll do is kind of help you to be aware of the things that you would need to work on uh, and what you need to practice on. All right, thanks for coming. See you next week.